This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. Producer-director Jenna Ricker has worked solely in narrative film, until now. In Qualified, her first nonfiction feature, the film's subject is a pioneer in motorsports and feminism, driver Janet Guthrie, the first woman to compete in the Memorial Day spectacle, the Indianapolis 500. Janet started out as an aerospace engineer with a longing for flight and a parallel love for motorsports, which in turn steered her into racing on the stock car circuit. In 1977, her passion and skill for auto racing, honed on road tracks like Daytona and Sebring, led her to be enlisted as the first woman to qualify for Indy. This required her not only to be an elite athlete reaching the pinnacle of American auto racing, breaking into one of the last bastions of a male-dominated sport, but she also had to endure an ongoing barrage of public insults and belittlement. Yet she persisted. Qualified as a documentary on a pivotal moment in U.S. sports history, a gripping and inspiring chronicle of the calm resolve of racer Janet Guthrie. Jenna, thanks for joining us. Um, sorry we didn't get to see you at uh, South by Southwest, yeah. but here in New York, it's, it's just as good. It's a great and, location. And we're uh, shooting this on the, when you walked in, you said today is the? Anniversary of Janet's qualifying at the Indianapolis 500, 1977. It's the 40, 40, 42nd. 42nd anniversary. 42nd today. years ago on this day, Janet Guthrie qualified. So we're on, when we're recording this, it's the cusp of the Indy coming up this week, yes. Memorial Day weekend. Yes, that's right. So uh, with that in mind, uh, how did you how did you get on this project? And talk just a little bit about you come from a total narrative background. Yes. So bearing that in mind, mm -hmm. and this is basically your first doc or your first, first, your first doc. doc or first feature doc? First doc, first feature doc, all how? of it at once. How, how, how? Um, so, okay, so I, I do, I come from, from narrative, writing and directing my own stuff actually so I've never been a, a director for hire in this in a feature world at least you know I've done some commercial stuff but never in the feature world and I've never yeah I've never taken someone else's script so it's always generated for me so um, so it was interesting to then approach someone else's story that I was going to shape and then to do it in documentary form so the way I came to the project to begin with was um, about 10 years ago um, I was asked by my producing partner, uh, a man by the name of Greg Stewart. We've co-written together, and I, I've done separately. We've co-written together. Um, he said, "Hey, my family does this road trip to Indy, you know, every year, and every year I'm available. I go. Do you want to come?" And I was like, mm, "I don't know if I want to go to Indianapolis <laughs> in the summer." Um, and he said, "No, no. I think I think you I think you think it's something, you know, racers culture or something kind of." you know, mm -hmm. rednecky to mm -hmm. not, you know, put her, you know. Like NASCAR. Yeah, exactly. Thing, so yeah. he's like, I don't, I don't think you realize how amazing this is. And I was a little skeptical, but I agreed to do this. So we take the road trip and I mean, it, have you ever been? No. Okay. It's, it's epic. So when you get there, first of all, you can hear the cars practicing uh, from like blocks away blocks away. That's you how loud they engines. are. Yeah. And then it's this massive, so, I mean, it holds like 500,000 people and it is actually hmm. the largest single day sporting event in the world. Hmm. So I know none of this and hmm. I'm walking into this like Coliseum basically. It's amazing. It's a two and a half mile track. It's huge. You can't see the other side of it. You know, it's, hmm. it's massive. So you walk in and then there's so much tradition and so much uh, reverence to the sport, to Memorial Day weekend. So imagine an, a huge stadium and when they go to play, the bugle goes to call taps, it falls absolutely quiet. Hmm. It's magical, like your whole body kind of feels this tingle because you're like, well, everybody just agreed to shush for a whole place, you know? And um, anyway, so it's all this beautiful, uh, pageantry at the beginning that you do you get emotional I was like you know wiping away tears I'm like what am I you know what am I doing at this event it's so big um, then they start up the engines and forget it I mean I did defy anybody to be like this it's is like, lame it's like the, it's this just, pendulum just yes, totally swings it's amazing and it, it fills your whole body and it resonates in your chest as they come by and you think 500 miles would be boring and it just it's not it's so engaging and and I think I left the 
I left it like on this buzz, on this high, and just had so many questions when it was over. I was, you know, what are the racers thinking? How do they do this? How do they concentrate while someone's feeding them information in their ears? And they have all these, you know, gadgets and things to figure out. And then also the fact that it's not, um, I love sports, but um, in so many ways, the sports I'm familiar with, team sports, uh, solo sports, the equipment is mostly your body and maybe like a ball or a racket or something. In, in motorsports, so many things have to go right with a piece of equipment and the team that's running it and the crew, the pit crew that's refueling and changing tires. So much of it has to go right to win a race like that. You just realize how, how insane it is to even want to enter into that field. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just realize the, the, the mountain you have to scale yeah. each time. So I was totally fascinated by that. So, um, so what, I start going every year, you know, I start going to the Indianapolis. And then a few years ago, um, we were on our way and I asked, hey, who was the first woman? Because I knew it wasn't Danica and I knew it wasn't Pippa, man, and who's in the race this year. Um, but I didn't know who the first one was. And Greg said, Janet Guthrie, 1977. I was like, what? What? So one feeling I had was, how the hell do I not know the first woman who qualified for the Indianapolis 500? Like, shouldn't this be stuff that's taught in, <laughs> in school, you know, like these breakthrough moments? Um, so I was, I was annoyed I didn't know that offhand or that it wasn't something readily available. Um, and then I just became so fascinated by her. So I started researching her. I discovered she'd written a book, uh, no, not ghostwritten entirely her, and it was a total page turner, so good. And then um, started reading about some of the contemporaries she was racing against as well to kind of formulate what this world was like. And as a narrative filmmaker, I thought, I want to make this a narrative. But there was so much story that I thought, you really, you really need to get to know Janet from the facts. Like, you got to see kind of what she was up against in the, in, and reintroduce her in that way. It just was, there was a doc and a narrative all in her story. So. Uh, so that's how I that's how I got to where I got to, and then I called her up, and thus began our dating period for a few years, and yeah. here we are. Plus, it's a you know it's a, you know when you said you're you you're kind of into sports and stuff. It's um, you know I can't think I'm not an expert on sports, or anything, mm. but I can't think of a whole lot of sports where you know it's strictly a man's sport. You know, there's oh, women's yeah. softball or whatever, yes. but you know, I mean, there are no women in baseball, right? No, but but it's a it's you know it's such a it's such an ultimate macho men's sport. Yeah. Um, so what that story must have been like when you pondered that. That's a great thing to bring to like bring up or point out because that was the other thing that fascinated me about it was that it's one of the few sports where men and women can totally complete, compete on an equal playing field because we're not talking about brute strength, right? There's not a woman in the NFL because frankly, no matter how strong she is, a man will still be stronger. And it's, you know what I mean? Like I, you, can, you can rationalize why we're not doing this at the same time together. Um, and then all the other sports too, like you said, they're gender separated, male tennis, female tennis, yeah. et cetera. Racing doesn't exist like that. It's male, it's totally male dominated and, and macho and testosterone, all that stuff. But a woman can compete in it. There's not a like women's league and a men's league. And I thought it was so interesting because once the helmet goes on and you sit in that car, you cannot tell me, you, you have no idea if it's a man or a woman. And it makes that even better to me. I think that makes it even more accessible. Uh, and yet here we are 42 years later and there's only one woman in the race this year. So, mm. you know, the, the needle sadly hasn't moved much or as much as it should have. Yeah. But it is, that is a great thing about the sport. It actually should be celebrated that the competition sees no gender. When we announced that we were going to take a shot at Indianapolis, to my enormous astonishment, the fact that I was a woman was going to be a really big deal. I just got the impression that not everybody was jumping up and down about this. This was not only invading auto racing, but invading the top of what was considered the top of auto racing. I mean, she's 38. To even start at that age, people were very skeptical. Where did she come from? What did she do? 
Well, I've driven in the International Manufacturers Championship races at Daytona and Sebring on seven occasions. So I've... They expressed their skepticism, and I simply stood on my record. I had been racing sports cars professionally, competing against men and women. I had built the engine from scratch to race in the 2.5 Challenge Series. I won the B-Sedan Championship, two firsts in class at the Sebring 12-hour runs and the Daytona 24-hour racing with drivers of world renown. That seemed to cut no mustard at all with the roundy round boys. You didn't conceive that a woman could actually win or beat you on in something as macho as the Indy 500. He's through the doors. What happened? We'd had some very serious accidents, very serious fires. People been killed. Maybe ladies shouldn't do that sort of thing. You know, we we see these headlines uh -huh. um, that you know they were um, they weren't. Let's say they weren't polite. They were pretty nasty. <laughs> yeah, you know they were some nasty. of the quotes. I don't think you could get away with it today, I and mean, you certainly couldn't actually. You couldn't write that in the newspaper. Yeah, one quote says unqualified. Unqualified. <laughs> one, yeah, yeah. One says, "I mean, bitch. Yeah. Um, she should be home having babies." Right. If she can, I think it's If she it's can, there. if she can, that's right. I don't, I don't even think it's even worth saying who who said no, those things no. or not, right? No. Uh, but you know, that's what she was up against. Yeah. And questions, a woman at Indy, question mark, you know, is this a joke, question mark? She's going to get somebody killed. She's going to get yeah. somebody killed, yeah. yeah. She can't do it. Yeah. It was, it was nuts. And so tell us just a little bit about uh, her first team, because I, I, that was very interesting to me, the story of the first, uh, you know, team manager. Yeah, so you and Janet first enters the yeah. field, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Janet's first team, uh, she was actually called by a man by the, uh, by the name of Rolla Volstead, who ran a small outfit, who was totally passionate about the sport, and he was very innovative in what he would do. And that era of racing, too, is an era that uh, doesn't exist anymore. Back in the day, some guy could be working on his car in his garage and bring it to Indy and have a shot at making the field. Like an open trial. Yeah, or exactly. Like that. Yeah. You know, and today, you know, for safety reasons, et cetera, et cetera, the chassis are all similar, or the engines are all similar. It's either, you know, a Ford or a Honda or something like that. But then that wasn't the case. Guys were building their own stuff. Um, so, anyways, Rolla Volstead, Pacific Northwest, he's out in the Portland area, and he has a business. I think he's in, like in the timber business or something. But on the side, he really loves racing. So he builds these cars and he has the shop. And um, he was always trying to find a way to stay competitive and, and maybe get more sponsorship because it's uh, so much of it is the money. If you have the money, you can go fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. that's the deal. It's the machine. It's the machine. It's about the machine. Yeah, totally. So Partially. Yeah, but first and foremost, I think. And yeah, then the it just gets better and the, and the, and with the, the driver. And how the machine holds up. Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, so anyway, so Rolla is looking for something and some different things, and he um, he finds out. He starts asking around the ra road racing circuit. In the road racing world, it wasn't so sexist. I mean, women there weren't a ton of them, but they weren't as, you know they weren't sidelined. You know, thirteen anything. years of road racing, so she had experience. But it is it is important to note, um, which we didn't, weren't able to go as far into it in the film. You know, it's a little more inside baseball. But she she did come from like shitty. Can I cuss? Of course you can. Okay, from crappy cars uh, <laughs> in road racing to to leaping into the top, you know, to championship racing cars. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, she was racing in Daytona or Sebring and stuff with AJ and um, uh, and Mario Andretti, et cetera. But these guys were racing a different class of car. They're racing the Ferraris and the Porsches. She was racing the Toyotas, you know. So even though she was in the race at the same time, she was still in bad equipment. But she would come first in class. She would end up doing well. Mm -hmm. So the leap she makes, this is more to her credit. It's not really a criticism. It's huge. It's huge. It's like, yeah. like somebody said to me the other day. It's like if your son played basketball well in high school, you would assume, or in junior high, you'd be like, he can play in the NBA. 
This is massive. Yeah. So anyways, so she, um, she's on the road circuit. Rala starts asking around, and her name is the name that keeps coming up. So he calls her. She thinks it's a joke. She does. She thinks it's someone just playing a prank on her. Hmm. And then she reaches out to an expert in the field, Chris Economaki, who ran um, National Speed Sport News and just had his finger on everything going on in the sporting world. Yeah, he was a big ABC uh, sporting, yeah. road racing commentator. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she calls him up and he's like, no, this guy's for real. You should probably call him back. Hmm. <laughs> so she calls him back and, um, and that's how it starts for her. So this team is a small team. He builds, he's building his own cars. And, uh, you know, if something breaks in their car, they're looking for like a used part somewhere, you know, what can fit, what can make this work, you know, in, in, in contrast to the major teams who are like, oh, that's gone, go to the shelf and get a brand new one and let's mess around. So it was a small team, not a lot of guys running it and um, a, lot of, a lot of grit and spirit more than anything else. Mm. So how did she make the, the next leap? I mean, you get into this, your film, I don't want to spoil too much, but, mm. um, but she she made a leap from from uh, Volstead's team to getting well. I mean, she had sponsors in in road racing. I think well, yes. Kelly Girl. Kelly Girl was NASCAR. Was, that was NASCAR. That was NASCAR. And I thought that was kind of ironic. Yeah, right. <laughs> Kelly Girl is secretarial temp right. service. Yes, right. yes. But how did she make the leap? You know, to getting. I I think there was one part where that. You know, again, I don't want to spoil too much, but you know, the spon the whole sponsorship thing is a really interesting part of the Huge film. Huge piece of it. Yeah. You know, um, how would it, how did that leap happen? Well, it's so funny. So she was with Raul and the team. You know for various reasons that you see in the film, the team ultimately falls, she falls, <clears throat> leaves the team. Um, and she doesn't have sponsorship for Indy any longer. And in fact, her Kelly girl uh, contract was, was expiring. And none of it had to do with performance. It was like anything, sponsors are gonna be like, can I make money off of this? Mm. And I don't think they were capable of seeing how they could have made money. I think they were afraid of it. They, they I don't, they didn't, couldn't identify it. Like a matcha CEO, was, was he even common with Janet Guthrie? Forget that, but AJ Foyt, yeah, I like that yeah, guy, yeah. you know? And I think it was just kind of the reality, well, it's the reality today too. Like you see, you identify with what you recognize. And if you don't recognize that, what, what is its purpose to you? you there, know? there was a there was a part where uh, I, th I think it was AJ that actually mm -hmm. kind of stepped in uh, when other other racers were being very disparaging mm -hmm. and stepped in and allowed her to drive for his team. Yeah, for his, his backup car. I yeah. thought that was fascinating. It is fascinating. You know, he's he's like his nickname is Supertex. You know, I mean, he's just total male bravado, you know, and um, excellent racer. I mean, super amazing. His records just like keep turning the pages of all the, you know, races he's won. He's a four-time indie holder. Um, he, he's amazing. And he really was like the, epi you know, what's the word for it? Epi epitome. epitome. Thank yeah. you. I was like epitome. Yeah. Yeah. Epitome of, you know, male, sure. yeah. you know, chauvinism in a way. Everybody knows the name. I yeah. mean, like, you everybody know, Andretti, AJ Foyt, yeah. Unser. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so um, when her car in 76, the first year she comes to Indianapolis to qualify, attempt to qualify, uh, her car, it's not working. It's not getting up to speed. It's not going to happen. And so, um, you know, the car qualifies, not the driver. So if you can find another car and you can get it up to speed, you have a shot oh. at the race. So Rala went around and was asking people, which is most of the time the driver does that, not the owner of the car. And most of the time the driver's like, I got to find a ride. But obviously, why would the owner try to get you in another right. car right. if it's right. not their own? Right. So anyways, he's going around, he's asking people, and everyone's like, for her? Mm, nope. And um, A girl? Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when they'd have you know, mechanical issues, it's not uncommon to swap you know, uh, equipment or share equipment. And when that would happen, the guys working on our car would go to another garage and they'd be asked, is that for him or for her? Hmm. Referring to her um, teammate, Dick Simon. If it's for Dick, I'll let you borrow it. If wow. it's for Janet, no. Wow. I know, isn't that amazing? So uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many of those yeah. stories um, that are just like shocking. Um, but in any case, so AJ said, yeah, I'll let her, I'll let her drive my backup car around. AJ's a total competitor. And you know, when we interviewed him, he talked about the fact he's like, listen, all it is is one more person for me to beat. 
I don't care what they are, who they are. Like, I just got to so beat didn't them. So he didn't really have that kind of barrier that so many of the other drivers have. No, I think he was a little bit like, we'll see if she can really do it. I mean, this is like take, takes a lot to drive 500 miles in the heat, you know, that fast, doing those left turns. You know, it's a lot. Mm. So I think it was more like, I don't know if she really has it in her, but I'm willing to see if she does. Because mm. then if I can see she can do it, I can beat her, you know? Mm. So that competitive nature in him just over... It was a little road. ballsy of him to his backup car, though. You know, it it too, is, you know? because if something happens to his actual car, yeah. he needs that. Yeah, right, he right. needs it for parts. Like It's not like he can right. drive that in the race, but he'd right. have to go to it for right, parts. Right, right. So, um, huh, so it was a big deal, and everybody did freak out because, uh, like one of the characters say, says in the film, he was very private. Like, he kept his windows you know, covered. You know, didn't want anybody knowing any secrets, you know, didn't want anybody figuring things out. So he, he did keep, the, when she rolls out, everyone goes nuts. But the other thing we didn't get to do in the film is um, AJ taped over all the gauges. So she couldn't see how fast she was going. Really? Yeah. Now, we couldn't cover it in the film because uh, wow. it would have taken a lot more to explain what that would have meant, you know, because some people thought it was like, oh, he's trying to screw with her. but. You know, Janet's viewpoint of it is that he didn't want her to know any secrets. You know, did he have a turbo boost here? Did he have this thing there? He didn't want her to know any of that. So, like, I'm so the only thing that wasn't just, covered was the speedometer, basically. No, even that was co- even the speedometer was covered. was covered. Yeah. So how'd she know how fast she was going she other didn't. than the? So they call the uh, the tachometer, the tachometer, yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So that was covered, and so she just he just said to her, just use fourth gear. Like, don't go past fourth gear. And she comes in. So she didn't even know if she was over revving the engine. Yeah. So she comes in um, because there someone else who was practicing on the track had a oh, little mishap. God. So there's a yellow. Wow. She comes in, and she says that AJ pulled it back, saw how fast she was going. He's like, next time use fifth gear, because she was going so hard on fourth gear. <laughs> she didn't know. She's like, okay. <laughs> so he knew she could do it, and um, no. and I think the fact that it took so long for him to emerge from his garage and come up with his decision about whether or not to let her qualify the car, um, I think it speaks to the fact that knowing AJ and his competitive nature, he he probably would have gone for it. You know, if I can beat my own car, what about that? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but I think his crew is like, no way. We mm. put a lot of time and energy <laughs> into this car. We don't know what's going to happen. We need it. It's expensive. Yeah. yeah so. And uh, there was something very interesting. I don't want to spoil that either because it's so <laughs> cool in the film. But there's a great sort of payoff uh, when uh, when she raced her final race. Oh yeah. And uh, you know she got injured, and yeah. um, that she managed to race injured, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. Just the injury itself that she yeah. was able to race. It, yeah. I mean, any injury, but that particular injury yeah, is incredible. It is. And she didn't reveal it, mm-hmm. uh, but she revealed it afterwards. Right. And was she maybe not concerned she would have been disqualified after? Yeah, it's interesting. I um, It's funny because when you watch that bit of archive, there is a moment in her, I think, just in terms of um, body language. There's a moment where she kind of like when she does reveal it, she kind of like, huh. mm, you know, and you think, you know, we would watch that in the edit and we'd be like, did she just realize that she said it? it was like, oh God, oh crap, what did I just do? You know what I mean? Like the it's high of what just happened made me stop thinking about it, you yeah. know, and now I'm like, well, maybe I should yeah, yeah. shouldn't have said it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it was just so spontaneous. And I was actually, she and I have been doing all this press lately and I was asking her about it and she said, I think I was just so like, you know what, I've had it with this, like, women can't do it. You, he just asked her, you know, a lot of people said you couldn't do 500 miles, and she's like, you don't even know the half of it. You know, I think it just came out of yeah, her yeah. so um, organically. Well, I mean, you know, Excuse me. uh, people have to see this film because it just, it's, you know, it, it, her, her attitude is unflappable. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And especially given the time that it was, and like you said before, such a male dominated and, and bitter and nasty. Yeah, uh, I mean, even, you know, even in the commentary, these you know, wonderful commentators, you just realize how it's of the period too. They're constantly calling her a girl. Yeah. You know, how'd our girl do? Yeah. Is she tired out there? You know, yeah. and it's like, all the, yeah. and it's like yeah. they don't even realize that they're being sexist you know, in their approach to her. So it was um, from all angles. Um, and you know the only other women on the grid were beauty queens, you know, which <laughs> right. which 
actually still exists. I was just in Indy watching the Grand Prix and the Indy Lights. Oh, really? And when the guys won, at least the Indy Lights, the younger men won three trophy girls. And I'm thinking, I was like, are you kidding me? It's 2019. Still... It's 2019. And this is what happens for me now. I look at that and I think, so the young boy watching that says, I can be a racer. And the young girl watching that says, I can be a trophy girl. I was so mad. <laughs> I just found myself so Well, especially so like, like you said, you know, there, it's 2019 and there really is, there's yeah. one woman in the field? One woman in the field this year. And it's the only, it's similar to Janet. It's a one race a year thing. They're going to do the big marquee race. You know, the Indy 500 is the yeah. biggest race of all. Yeah. So that's where they're willing to put some money. But there's no way she can run up front if it's the only race of the year with a team that hasn't like perfected their stuff, you know, like had a lot of, and a car she hasn't been racing an awful lot in, mm. it's the, the deck gets stacked, you know, so. It's, it's, it's a fabulous film. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think, uh, well, I think people will know that ESPN is behind this. Yes. So, uh, will it be, will you be able to see the film on ESPN? Yeah, so it premieres on Tuesday, May 28th. Okay. Uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern, so everyone should just check their listing. Or set your DVR. Um, set their DVR for sure. Um, and yeah, so to, so I'm so excited. It's going to be like right on the heels of the Indy 500. Yeah. And like, you know, people are all jazzed up about how this crazy, amazing, epic race works, you know? So it's it's going to be exciting. Yeah, it's 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 really a riveting film. I mean, I you know, and, and, it's, and to, it's very heavily archival. Yeah. Uh, but it... So works. It so works. Well, so know, I, I, but I want to know. I want to yes. know a little bit about coming from narrative yeah. to your first documentary. Mm -hmm. What that was like for you. So coming from coming to my first documentary from solely narrative background was pretty fun. Actually, I think. I think some of the things that translated, I was surprised at some of the things that translated, I should say, and I'll tell you about those in a second. And then I was to, I was intrigued with the differences in a really fun, challenging way. So that some of the things that translated well, that I, I had no idea would translate well, is um, narrative world, I work with actors. And when you're working with actors, um, which is actually what I originally started out doing when I was much younger, I came to NYU and studied acting and all of that. Um, quickly discovered I preferred writing and directing, but um, what you realize when you're working with actors is it's not about what you want them to do or as a character to do. It's about listening to what they need from you to like fully bring something, bring all their talents and bring it to life, you know? It's not like treating them like robots, you know? Oh, no, do this and do that. And so you really have to like force your listening ear, like what's the actor really asking me when they say they don't understand the dialogue? Because it seems pretty, mm -hmm. seems pretty clear. So mm -hmm. what are they asking me? They need something from me, you know. And you, so you have to like really work on honing your listening skills about what the subtext is of what's being asked of you. So when I started doing these interviews, I was especially like, whoa, how's this going to go? You know, I really need to cover a lot with these guys because I don't know what I'll use in the edit and how what they bring to the story will help shape a story because I didn't want to use a narrator, you know, I didn't want to use a voiceover of like, and then this happened, and then she did that. So I was coming into it trying to create story beats and just hoping how could I, how would I get that story beat? How would it translate in the edit? And that's very scary. It's very, uh, feel sometimes like you're throwing a dart, like are all these questions going to get what mm. I need? And But what I started to discover was like the more I listened, the more I could hear did they really understand the question, or is that really what happened? Um, what do they need for me to relax and just feel like they can tell me what they're, you did, know? Did you pre-interview everyone? Just all over the phone, you know, just telling them what we we're yeah. looking for and would they be willing, and mm -hmm. um, and then I would shoot them an email and say, these are the areas we're going to cover. If you want to refresh, you know, if you so you can have it on your mind, but never never a specific question. It mm. was like when Janet qualified and what the problems with the car were and those kinds of things uh, generally. So um, so that was like a surprising thing I started to discover. I was like, yeah, just listen, just listen to what they're needing from you versus being like, okay, next question and now I need this and now, you know. It's, so that, that was interesting. I didn't expect that. And then on the other side of things, you know, with the narrative, you've written the script, you shot the script, you're walking into the edit knowing everything you have 
and maybe everything you don't have, right? <laughs> so you're, you can only work with what you know you got. Right. Um, going into this, I knew I wanted to tell it, if I could tell it with archive, that was the goal. I wanted to tell as much of it with archive as possible. And there's some amazing archive. It is, of and it's actually eighty percent archive. Yeah, wow, and is it eighty percent? Eighty percent archive, huh. and it's archivally, it's all archive except for the contemporary interviews, and then the very end of the film when we bring you into the present. So all of her stories told visually are archivally, um, and that was the goal. I don't know if I would be able to do it, but that was the goal heading into it. Um, then we just started getting all this amazing archive. And the difference from narrative to doc for me was forming the story in the edit. You know, you know, was this story beat going to work? Do we have the archive to make it work? So there were some stories that didn't happen, um, and I don't think ultimately to the detriment of the film. But there's some stories that didn't happen because I couldn't tell it archivally, and that was kind of a rule I set for myself. I was like, if I can't tell it archivally. Oh, you know, we can't have it. Um, yeah. But I mean, conversely, I had to know I had this story archivally. Right, 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 <laughs> you right, know? Right. So it was, it was just this really fun kind of crazy challenge to, um, to it's, the, it's the inverse, I guess. It's like when you write and direct, you're visualizing it and then you make it show up. And in this case, you have to find the visuals that already exist that fit into that space and really tell that moment for you. Um, and so that was a great, a super great, fun challenge. And, and then at some times when I would get stalled in the edit, I'd be like, oh, this is, I'm just not feeling something here, or this or that. That's where my narrative thing would come in. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, that's because I'm staying a beat too long here, or that's because I've told the answer. Like, you know, the, we, we've put a button on it, and now I don't care anymore mm. to discover the next beat. Mm. You know, so that was, that was fun to go back and forth and be like, no, 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 let them want it, you know, get in early, or come in late, leave early, that sort yeah, of whole, yeah. whole idea. That was one of the things that also drove the edit. I would be like, no, 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 I don't want to know. Like, I don't want someone to say, and so then she blah, blah, blah. Like, right, 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 okay, right. like, yeah. let's move to the next one. Make them know? want more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it was interesting. It was- It's a different kind of puzzle. Totally, yeah. totally. So that was my experience of like the, the shift. <laughs> and I don't know if I told a contemporary doc how much more different that would be then, you know, because or a verite doc where you're like just discovering. I, I, can, I can only imagine the challenge that is. Do you is. want to do something like that? Um, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I think it would all have to do with what the subject was, right? Mm. I mean, you've got to be deep in and love it. Mm. Now, your interviews are very nicely shot. I should give a oh, shout yes. out to your DP. Yeah, so we had, we had uh, two DPs because of location stuff, mm. both amazing. So Nick Higgins um, did Janet's interview, which is most, you know, just a prominent amount of the film. Um, and several ones on the West Coast. And then at Indianapolis, we had the fantastic Christine Ning, who, I mean, both of them, just such a joy to work with and so much fun to like set up the interviews. And they both were like, are you kidding me with these locations? Um, <laughs> that's where my narrative mind came in. I was like, no, 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 locations. <laughs> like, you know, production design. Like that's as much production design yeah, as I can bring it. to right it. There, yeah, yeah right. So it was, it was fun. Now, did I read correctly that You've got a narrative, you have a narrative version of the yes, story? Yes, yes. So we, um, we uh, optioned the rights to Janet's autobiography. And, um, and definitely, like I said, like I finished the book being like, oh my God, this is a doc and a narrative. This is a narrative and a doc. Right. Like you, you yeah. just see so much like, of the yeah. story. Yeah. But there's so much you can't cover in a doc, like her personal life. She did have a lover at the time. Um, yeah, she totally skirted that in the film. Yeah, right? when she was uh, yeah. in an archival interview. I think she, she was asked that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Personal question. Um, and you know, we <clears throat> and there was a couple reasons actually we skirted it. One again, didn't live in archive, so wasn't gonna right. do it. But the other thing too is I feel like so often with successful men, the question is like, and how's your wife, and what's going on with the women in your life? You right. know, it's all about his trajectory. But often with women, it's like. You know, all of a sudden the questions are like, but did she have a boyfriend? What was happening? And you're thinking, it's so interesting. Why mm. can't we just tell her story? Mm. Mm. It, you know, um, I suppose if Janet was juggling like a family at home, certainly. But in terms of like lovers, you know, it's not, not so interesting in the context of the doc, you mm. know, or not so valuable for me in the context of the doc. 
But in the narrative, I do think it's something you can, you can, you can experience some of that. You can experience, she does seem unflappable, but she had her moments. And when you can experience those moments with her in a narrative, I think they're really powerful. Mm. You know, she did have some real go back and kick the tires, throw something in the garage moments. How does, you know. how does she feel about the narrative side of it? It's so funny. I keep saying, Janet, we have to talk a little bit more about the narrative because, you know, there's all of her, all the men in her life, she gave them AKA or whatever. She gave them pseudonyms, right? She didn't name the real wow. people. And so I have my suspicions getting to know her story so well about some of these people who are predominant in that time. And I just sort of need to know, if, do we have the okay to name them or do we... Or do we character cr create a character <laughs> loosely based, based on, on yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so um, but she feels she feels good about it she's um, she was asked uh, by somebody one of the press people we were speaking with like, what actress does she think you know does she think does uh -huh. she have someone in mind and Janet said um, well all when I used to think about this I had women in mind, but they're all too old or deceased <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> so we, we got some people in yeah, mind. We'll that's see. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Well, Jenna, thank you very much for sharing with this with us and yeah. the clips that we've shown. And congratulations to you and to Janet. Thank uh, you. Give her our best, yes, if you would. And I will. Um, it's it's great timing, and um, it is great timing. I hope you get some really good. Publicity and yeah, uh, and also the you know the the narrative sounds exciting. Yeah, too. you can come back and talk about the narrative. And I how would, did lie, we, I would how love did we shoot to. that moment in the car yeah. when you did. Yeah, <laughs> that would be to. awesome. Okay. Yeah, Jenna, thank thanks, you. Thanks again. Really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much. It. Thank yeah. you. Got it. What do you get when you combine over 125 years of camera lens heritage and the latest in autofocus technology? The Zeiss Bodice engineered exclusively for Sony mirrorless full-frame sensor cameras, the Zeiss Bodice delivers perfect corner-to-corner -corner image quality. With enhanced protection against the elements, the Zeiss Bodice is built to help you push past life's obstacles. Zeiss Bodice, the perfect lens for wherever your passion leads you. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next time for another edition of Zeiss Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn more about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com. <laughs>